person I'd like to introduce is Jessica Bassinet, known as Jess. Jess is a second grade teacher in the Berkshires, which is uh, the Western end of Massachusetts. And most recently, she just learned that she has been nominated and then became a semi-finalist for Massachusetts Teacher of the Year. So let's give her a big round of applause. I'm so excited because I know, I've known Jess for a long time and the impact that she's had on so many children on the soccer, on the softball field and in the classroom has been remarkable. So she's currently a second grade teacher and a 15 year veteran as well as a semi-finalist for Massachusetts Teachers of the Year and we will be hearing from Jess shortly. The other person that I have such um, uh, the honor of introducing is Jeff Donald. And I had the opportunity to interview Jeff for a show in Pittsfield about uh, self-care and health and well-being. And Jeff has the distinct title of the only mindfulness coordinator that we know of in the United States for a very large school district in Montgomery uh, County, Maryland. And so uh, I just wanted to say that we're thrilled to have you here, Jeff, and I hope you tell the story of how it really morphed from your classroom rolling out the mat right through the district as far as mindfulness goes. So thanks, Chris for those two um, really honorable introductions to these great contributors in education. You're muted. I clicked unmute, but not hard enough. Okay, so Jeff, um, do you wanna say a couple words and then introduce Khalil for us? Oh, certainly. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for allowing us to be here to uh, share our stories with you. Um, we're grateful that we live in a county where uh, mindfulness is considered to be a standardized, validated intervention for emotional and mental health. And uh, that's our big push is to take this beyond the county and, and take it nationally. So, because this is such an important practice uh, for kids to learn, not just as students, but throughout their entire lives. Uh, I'm lucky enough to uh, have funding to uh, have a team with me. And uh, I have a exemplary colleague, another member of my team with me, Khalil Kirkendall. And Khalil is in university. She is, uh, uh, amongst other things, <laughs> she does many, many amazing things. She's uh, an economist, you name it. So uh, she also uh, spends 40 hours per week um, bringing mindfulness to students uh, in Montgomery County. And she's a, a one of three people. So Khalil, thank you for being here. She has a tremendous amount of wisdom and thoughts to offer. Khalil, would you like to say a word or two? Um, just thank you so much, um, Jeff. And thank you, Dr. Mason. Um, I'm just really, really excited to be here. And I can't wait to share uh, some of the tools that we use um, in the classroom with Montgomery County Schools. Um, and just um, to be really honest, I use these same tools with my students. Jeff said American University, but it's George Washington University. I teach a course in stress management. So later I will um, share one of the tools uh, that we uh, have with MCPS. So thank you again. Excellent. And uh, last but not least, our fearless leader here, uh, Paul Levenow, who is the president of CEI and the executive director of the Michigan Elementary and Middle School Principals Association. And Paul, we're so glad you're able to join us. Do you have a couple words? Well, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks uh, for joining us this afternoon from your busy schedules, looking for some inspiration. I'm always delighted to, to learn from uh, those uh, that join panelists and even people that share uh, in the chat box, uh, gather new resources because we're uh, really, really uh, neck deep in working in SEL and trauma-informed practices. 
here in, in Michigan. So I'm here to share and to learn. Excellent. And so now we are going to turn to Khalil, who's going to lead us in a mindfulness exercise. Okay, this is the fun part. All right, so it is, if you're in Washington, D.C. or on the East Coast, it's a little after 4 p.m. So we've all had a pretty good portion of our day and it would just be great to infuse ourselves with some mindfulness. So I'm gonna ask if we will all just, maybe just make a conscious effort to sit up in our chairs, just a little bit taller so that your spine is nice and straight. Maybe roll back your shoulders, release any tension, any residual we may be carrying in the shoulders. If it feels right, just for a few seconds, maybe close your eyes or just bring your gaze downward, whichever is preferred and most comfortable. And I want you just to close your eyes, looking downward and just begin to focus on your breath. We're just breathing long and deep, full and complete in and out of the nose. Let's just take a moment reminding ourselves that mindfulness is really about developing that heightened awareness of the present moment. So in these few minutes that we have, I want you to try hard to really resist the urge of maybe revisiting your past, whatever happened before this webinar or anything you anticipate happening in the future. Let's challenge ourselves to just be right here, right now. Today, we're going to have an experience of awareness of the senses. So just get comfortable. We're gonna use a tool called guided imagery and research has shown that this can really increase relaxation and reduce stress. So if it feels a little bit awkward, just close your eyes and listen. So today we're gonna to take a walk through a forest. This will all be done in your mind. I want you to begin to imagine that you're walking down a path. Again, stay focused on your breath. Imagine that there's a balloon in your belly. So on the inhale, feel that expansion in the belly and the diaphragm. Allow your body to be stimulated with the breath. As you walk down this path, notice that the ground below your feet is soft. It's made of fallen leaves and salt mulch. Up ahead of you, there are trees. We're still breathing. Just allowing ourselves a few moments. As you continue to walk towards the trees, as you follow the path, you feel safe and at peace as you walk. As you walk, take a deep breath. Fill your lungs completely with this fresh, clean air of the forest. Exhale, let it out. Again, take in another deep breath. Feel how cool, crisp, refreshing the air is. Let it out. Really feeling the warmth of your exhale. Continue to breathe as you walk. So we're tuning into all of our senses, our sense of smell, touch, taste, hear. So begin to notice the sounds around you. What do you hear? You may hear a bird sing, or maybe the crunching of leaves beneath your feet. You may even hear and feel the soft breeze around you. Notice your body, feel your body relax, keep breathing. Notice what you see. Maybe take a look at the top of a tree. 
Notice the leaves and the different color greens that you see. Maybe even notice the sun peeking through the treetop and the land at the path. Look around, breathe, notice the colors, the textures, and everything around you. Look at the colors of the bark, tan, brown, black. Notice the colors of the leaves, dark green, light green, brown. As we're transitioning into the spring, what else do you see? Maybe you notice a fallen tree that fell after the storm or the rain. Maybe you see birds flying over your head. Take a look around the forest. Notice your breathing on the inhale, you're expanding on the exhale. We're just releasing, we're letting go as we walk and breathe. Now notice what you feel. Feel the warmth of the sun hit your skin as you walk. Notice the cool breeze on your face. Feel the soft path beneath your feet. Notice what you smell. Inhale, exhale. Smell the fresh air of the forest. Smell the trees and the leaves around you. Smell your surroundings with each breath in. Now look up ahead. Notice that there's a break in the trees. As you continue walking, as you leave the trees, you see a field of grass. Maybe you've gotten tired from your walk and you've chosen to take a moment to lay down. As you lay down in the grass, feel the grass, hug your body. Up above, you see the sky, breathe. You see the clouds moving past the sun. Exhale, inhale. You feel the cool breeze, but you also feel the warmth of the sun. You are comfortable, you are at peace. Enjoy this place that you have created for a few more moments. Continue to breathe and notice the world around you. When you're ready, begin to bring attention back to your body. Maybe wiggle your fingers, maybe wiggle your toes, maybe turn your wrists, maybe move your ankles. Maybe bring our arms over our head, bringing ourselves back into our bodies. Maybe wiggle the fingers. And finally take a deep inhale, breathe through the nose. And now let's exhale, let's open the mouth. Let's give ourselves a nice smile and enjoy the rest of our program. Thank you so much, Dr. Mason. And Khalil, thank you. Wow, I feel so much better. Mm -hmm. I actually went for a walk earlier today. So it was, it's, I've been outside in nature walking, which was fantastic, a really good self-care thing. And now a second trip into nature today. So can't get better than that. Michelle, would you talk with us a bit about executive functioning and mindful leadership? Most certainly. And thanks, Khalil. It's, it's, <laughs> I'm just coming out of it still because it is so relaxing and it's a great reminder of how healing nature is as well. So thank you again. So as we get to this pivotal point, right, Chris, we, we are in the third part of mindfulness practices, which talks about mindfulness instruction and specifically the importance of executive functioning. And, you know, when we think about how, how our brains work and how the hardware and is so complex, it's really important to understand to a certain degree how our brains fit in to this big puzzle in order to help, you know, understand how one student, for instance, has processing challenges and how that, how they may experience challenges from trying to shift gears, while others might have difficulty retrieving information that they're, they're trying to remember for the next step in a math um, program. So when we think 
about neuroscience, I think this is like the best time to be alive, right? Because what we've learned is that our brains are extremely malleable and it's called neuroplasticity where we have the ability to really regenerate new brain cells. And in that process or how to do that, one of the tools that we can look to is mindfulness. That, that beautiful guided imagery that, that Khalil just took us through is one example of how it takes our whole nervous system and calms down our brains and all those neurons, billions that are firing simultaneously. It allows kids to take a step back, a deep breath, calm their mind, to calm their nervous system so that they're open for learning. And when we're talking about mindfulness, it's not only the foundational skill, but it's, it's um, to really help uh, calm the body. It's also one that facilitates executive functioning. And the most critical functioning skills like working memory, thinking flexibly, um, self-monitoring and focusing and attention and organizing and planning and prioritizing and your focused attention are, are not only critical 21st century skills that are required to be successful, right, in, in life and um, also college and, and work, but to be successful in relationships. And so our working memory is like, it's akin to, in our book, we, we call it like a mental sticky note uh, that we use to keep track of information when we need it. And so I'm, well, I'm not gonna go into great detail about the importance of, of executive functioning, because as educators, I've just described some of the skills that are so critical to learning and to living. But in page on page 140 to 145, it takes you through this whole series of how we can strengthen executive functioning skills. But remembering that mindfulness is one of those first steps, tools of opportunity. So with that, I just wanna talk quickly about mindfulness leadership, mindful leadership as well, which is the last piece. And we'll circle around at the end, Chris, again. But what I wanna mention is as we're talking, some of you are in different places, uh, even though we've started from the what in the why mindfulness is so important and we've come to this point, now what, right? So we're still in different places of that non-what. But mindset becomes critical in what we do from here on in. And in the first chapter, we asked, are we doing enough? In this last chapter, we take it to a whole nother level about how to take care of ourselves in students, because after all, the students are our future. And how we as mindful leaders in the classroom in the wider school community and beyond, like Paul, he's he's at the you know state level working with all the superintendents. We have policymakers. How we can all be mindful leaderships by changing that mindset through working through mindful practice, but staying the course to understanding how important our mindset that we can change the course ahead for our students. And through showing fearless leadership and a drive for change, we can become the change agents we seek. So without further comment on that, I just wanted to set the stage to please just be flexible, open-minded and, and open-hearted to the aspect of really being those change age, agents, all of you in, in, in little and large ways. So the next panelist that we're going to hear from is actually Renee in school leadership, right, Chris? Did you want to That's add about Renee, Dr. Renee Owens' work? Sure, sure. Before I do, I want to remind you too that to be a mindful leader means that you first need to be mindful yourself. So you need to do the practice. <laughs> you need to do the breathing, the self-care. It's really hard to be there for others in a conscious, mindful way if you're not doing these practices. So 
Just a reminder. We always say, reminder. practice the practice. That right. simple. Just remember that your, your little reminder, ding, 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 practice the practice first. Yeah, so Dr. Renee Owen is one of the board members for CEI, and she was um, a principal for quite a long time, executive director of an independent school in North Carolina, the Rainbow Community School, where they implemented mindfulness practices and uh, many of the things we're talking about today in terms of a mindful school community in particular and using meditation practices, et cetera, during the school day. She is now an assistant professor at Southern Oregon University. So she's gonna share with us a little on video about her experiences and you know, her words of wisdom for us. So let's see if this works. I always say, you know, here I am with technology. So we're gonna cross our fingers, share my screen and hopefully we'll get what we need. Okay. Got to share sound on, so it should work. Okay. Give me a thumbs up. Hi, yes, I am Dr. Renee Owen at Southern Oregon University. I'm assistant professor in educational leadership, and I am and passionate about helping teachers and school leaders. Dr. Mason, we can't yeah. see her. We can't see her. No, okay. We can see your, the email screen. Okay, thank you. We're going to do welcome. this again because I thought I pressed all the right buttons. Okay. But this is always a lesson in an opportunity. Share sound. Share. Oh, I know. I forgot one more press. There she go. You got it, Chris. Okay, now I need to get her off mute. Oh. Okay, nope. I love it. So I've got an X by the sound. There. There you go. Now just put the sound up more. Yeah. Well, my sound's up all the way. Now, how do I get hers up all the way? on the icon love it you can nope. drag that blue ball all the way to the right oh the it's the blue bar thank every you morning, every single morning it takes a village so there's a sense of the human spirit being at the center of learning and at education and my advice after being at that school for 13 years is that as a leader one of the most important things you can do is that every time you are at a gathering where students gather or parents gather or teachers gather or the community gathers, if you are at all um, have a chance to speak or you're leading that gathering, to always begin every single meeting, every single gathering, every single day, whether it's the board or whether it's preschoolers, begin with some sort of centering. And it looks like this. Um, people preferably, um, if small enough and if there's room, they're gathered in a circle. If it's children, they're sitting down on the floor. If it's adults, there might be a thousand people in the room. They might not be in a circle. But um, to have some sort of focus. So if people are in a circle, you have a centerpiece. That might be a candle. That might be a bowl of flowers. Something that's a visual focus and then also an auditory focus, like a bell or a chime. You ring that bell. Everyone takes three breaths together. And there is a variety of different features that you could implement. You know, there could be greetings around the circle. There could be all sorts of things that people do, but at least having that focus and taking three breaths together. That's all it takes to, for a group of people to start feeling like they're one organism. Even as you picture my hands breathing in, breathing out. And when we do that together, we become like one set of lungs. And when students do that at the beginning of the day, they end up becoming incredibly connected to one another. Yes, teachers need to have their own practice and develop their own sense of heart-centeredness, 
but a teacher can only connect with each individual child so much. So you develop a container where the children fall in love with one another and support one another in a heart-centered environment. I saw the difference that this made at Rainbow Community School. I saw how intelligent those students became. I saw how mature they were. I saw their executive functioning and I saw the remarks that we got when they went on to high school, no matter what demographic they were come they came from. And I knew that it was really important that heart-centered learning be more available at a public school level. So I have transitioned and that is why I'm now a professor at a public school, very intentionally a public school. So I work now at a small public university that is very affordable. It, we have many first-generation students and we really sort of have our arms wrapped around about 13 school districts in Southern Oregon. And I'm finding out that this is an incredibly exciting time to be in public education. Uh, a man, um, Scott Nine, who's the head of the Department of Innovation, I think is what it's called, at Oregon Department of Education said, there is no more exciting time in the last 30 years than right now to be in public education if you want to develop schools and a school system that is equitable and innovative and educates the whole human being. He said, but principals and teachers don't know how to do it. They lack the imagination because we, most of us grew up in an industrial model of education and this educational reform model where we did not have that kind of sense of freedom, but it's there now. And the research is there, the brain science is there. So for school leaders, again, my one most important piece of advice is simply every time you have a chance to lead, that you develop a habit of heart-centeredness with your community. And you will see the culture change and the heart-centeredness grow. Thank you. So, um... It's always wonderful to hear from Renee. She is just uh, so experienced. You know, it's the wisdom of practice over many, many years. And to know that she's leading leaders now is very, very exciting. So we want to go from her to, um, to Jess. And Michelle, do you want to say anything more right now as we introduce Jess? Well, I just want to say that Jess is actually in our in our first book, Mindful Practices, and it's about the positive messaging. I don't know if anybody saw last night on the nightly news, but they had that teacher. And I said to my husband, that's Jess, because she was saying, <laughs> you are important, you are smart, you are capable. And that was how we uh, talked about Jess and what she does in the classroom in our first book. So Jess. Welcome, congratulations, thank you for spending the time, and please share with us some of the wonderful work that you're doing with heart-centeredness and mindfulness uh, at your school. Great, thank you, and thanks so much for that wonderful introduction. Hello, everybody. Thank you for taking the time to join today. Um, you know, as Dr. Uh, Dr. Murphy had said, I am, I'm so excited. I love teaching and I do love to empower my students every single day, as soon as they get to school and as soon as we're ready to leave for the day. They say very proudly, I am smart, I am important, and I can do anything if I try. I will graduate and I will be somebody. And we have been doing this for 15 years I've been teaching. We do it with all of my classes. And it's just nice to have positive self-talk and to have the kids feel empowered. And at first it's just repetition, repetition. And then they start to really utilize that. And they write these messages to themselves during little events throughout the class. So anytime we're taking a little check or a little quiz, I always have them turn over and write some positive self-affirmations to themselves. I say, give yourself a pep talk. What would you like to say? And they'll say, I can do this. I am amazing. I am so smart. I am going to rock this math test. So I always have them try to write themselves a positive message on the back of any activity we're going to do. And they really have, they really just embrace it and they really utilize it 
for their, to help them throughout the day. When they start to feel frustrated, it's really important to have a community where they uplift each other. So if someone's trying to answer a question and they have that little bit of wait time, you'll hear the kids say, let's give them good luck. You can do it. You can do it, buddy. You know, and then as soon as the kids answer, they uplift each other and say, nice job, good answer. So I'm proud to have classrooms that are really supportive, that have that empathy and compassion for each other, because I think it means a lot as far as creating that classroom community. Uh, this year was one like no other where we really were starting uh, in the virtual world and we had to really switch gears as educators of how do we take all of the, the tips and tricks and the community building that we always do face to face in that close engagement with those morning meetings and how do we do that in a virtual setting and it was an adjustment but the but once we got into it and we just realized we're all still here we're all still family we're just little squares to start but we will be getting back together I really tried to promote, we're still a family, we're still here, we're still all together. We just have to do it in a different way so we can be safe right now. So by having that positive attitude and really letting them see, feeling that hope and letting them know that we just have to keep doing what we're doing and, and we still do the same team building activities. Um, and if we were doing activities where the, it started to get a little hyper in the class, we would do the same thing we would do in person. All right, boys and girls, let's find our center. What does that look like? And even though they were all on mute and you could see their little, squ their little squares, you would see one hand on their heart, one hand on their belly, eyes closed and a nice big deep breath. And you could see them on the screen go. <sighs> and now the students will even say, oh, it's getting a little loud friends. I think we need to, we need to take a second. I find your center. <laughs> so they're comfortable enough where they will actually announce it in the class. Oh, Ms. Bessnett, can we just find our center for a moment? <laughs> so I tried to really, you know, have that family atmosphere in them. I really try to instill and practice the practice. Like you said, we have to model as teachers, what does that look like? How do we let the students know it's okay to feel vulnerable and do these things in front of each other? Because as adults, especially, we're like, I don't know, should we do this? Should we close our eyes? I'm, I'm not sure how many of you peeked one eye open, right? When we were doing that exercise, <laughs> I did a little peek, you know, just to see, because that's something that's, it's vulnerable. And when you're feeling in a community where you are comfortable, you can really do great things. Um, so we try to do different activities. I do play sounds. I'll play a bell. Um, I'll ring a little bell and we'll just practice having distractions. How do we stay mindful on something that we're working on? Um, so this morning I, I hit a little, I had a little uh, Zen Chinese bell there and I hit it and we just practiced. If we started with 10 seconds, can we keep all of our focus and attention just on this one sound? Then I did 20 seconds. We tried to hold it even a little bit more. And then we tried to do it for 20 seconds and I made purposely made distractive noises. I was walking around and banging on things and opening and shutting the door. And it was, they, they thought it was a game, but I'm really trying to get them to practice and focus on how can I stay mindful? How can I stay present? And how can I focus Focus on what I need to be doing. Because now, like I said, with this crazy year, we have to make sure those academic gaps stay nice and close. We want to make sure that everything's still moving forward in a positive way. So it's really important more now than ever to stay mindful and stay focused on their academic tasks. Um, we use a lot of yoga in the class. I've learned a lot from, I think uh, Julie Peller and Herrera is on this call. She is absolutely amazing. If you ever need any support or yoga moves or song, she is amazing and totally one of the most uplifting people I've ever met. But she's taught me some different yoga moves and strategies to even do chair yoga with the kids. Um, and the kids have really loved and enjoyed just having that moment of calm. And even in the school day, I know some teachers walk by, they're like, she's crazy. And you know what? I like being the crazy teacher because I will turn the lights off. I'll have them take their shoes off. All of my students have yoga mats in the classrooms. And there's times where they'll ask, can we just take a moment? And instead of putting that go noodle or that brain break on, we put the calming music on and we work ourselves through, self, through some yoga poses. And they now have taught themselves to have a yoga club outside while we're unable to use the equipment um, because of our current situation. They bring their yoga mats right outside and they have a little yoga club they wrote with chalk yoga club everybody's welcome <laughs> so they will go outside and do poses and i put some music out and they've totally bought in um, but and i don't want to take too much time but really just making sure we're teaching the kids and modeling you know it's okay to take a breath we want to have that positive self-talk and we want to have everybody on that moving forward uh, mindset so if you're feeling overwhelmed the first day we went back to full person my phone was ringing every five minutes. The schedule we had, physical schedule, switching from half day to full day changed three times within that day. And at towards halfway through the day, I said, you know what, friends? 
we need to stop just for a quick second. And even they kind of looked over. I said, I need to take a moment because I, as a teacher, am feeling a little frazzled right now. Can you all help me? So they could see that I was like, the phone would ring and I'm like, okay. So <laughs> they said, yes, Miss B, we'll do it with you. We'll help. And we just took that minute. And that's exactly what I needed because as teachers, we need to take care of ourselves too. So my overall message would be stay positive, go ahead and model everything that you're, you're doing for your kids that you expect them to do and, um, and, and let them write about it, talk about it and feel empowered. That's, so Jess, that was one piece I did want to talk, I, that I wanted you to talk about was the reflection piece, because that, you know, you're talking about second grade here. And a lot of times people say, how can you do the reflection piece, which is so critical to the whole process of practicing mindfulness to really understand where you're at. So can you just speak to that quickly, Jess, because um, I, I think you have something to read quick uh, about yeah, a reflection so Yes, I do have the students every morning do a social emotional journal and really just um, talking about what are the things you think you're really good at? What are the challenges? What are the areas you wanna show a growth mindset and get to? Um, and the students have really embraced. And at first they were like, I don't, I don't really know. I mean, I think I'm good at these things, but I, I don't know, am I bad at anything? And it just, you had to guide them through that whole process. But now they've, they've learned um, that they do have unique qualities, they are empowered. And also if things happen, how can we reflect on that and say, it's okay, tomorrow's a new day. So I had a student yesterday had a little bit of a tough day. And this morning he came in and the, the prompt was about having emotions. And it said, share, share a time when you were happy, sad, frustrated, or worried. And this little guy wrote all on his own. He said, today I feel, I feel happy because I'm ready for today. Yesterday I was disappointed in myself because I chose not to do my work but I'm ready for today and I'm gonna be okay. So just having a second grader have that much ownership of, yes, I know yesterday maybe was a rough day and I know today's a new day, lets me know that he feels comfortable and safe enough in that space where he can speak and speak like that. And another student, we talked about challenges. Challenges are things that are not easy for us. And this other little girl said, dear Mrs. Bazinet, I want to get better at meditating. It's hard to sit still and think about nothing sometimes. I wanna get better at meditating so I can get great at using nature powers that mother nature gave me and Santa Claus. Some people get so good at meditating that they can float up in the air. This is why I want to get better at meditating. <laughs> so having them take that minute and just, you know, being mindful and focused on their writing at that, at that time and really just sharing everything that's inside of them, I think is a beautiful thing. And I encourage you all to try it. Even as second graders, they can do it. So Jess, thank you so much. Wow, that was inspirational. Your enthusiasm is contagious and it's, it's just beautiful to see this in practice. So with that, we're gonna turn now to Jeff Donald, who remember if you have Jessica and we multiply her, I don't know, a hundred times, a thousand times over what we might have. So Jeff, to you. Hi everyone. Um, I, I don't wanna take up too much of everyone's time, but I really enjoyed hearing from Jess how she normalized the mindfulness work in her classroom. Uh, and I think that's really the key in, in any um, educational setting. And just like Dr. Owen said in her video is take every opportunity to normalize this work. Uh, I work in a very diverse county and many of our students, a majority of our students have had uh, no or very little access or opportunity to mindfulness or yogic practices. So it's really important that yes, we first model and that we also uh, uh, do it consistently and sustainably and many times over years before that just becomes part of that classroom culture. And it's interesting that we call this uh, uh, a portion of, of of this webinar, mindfulness leadership, because you don't have to be a leader to do this. You know, all all educators are the leader inside of their four walls, and they, you know, they're pretty much the the king or queen of the kingdom. You know, in in their classroom, and so you can do leadership within your four walls. And uh, Dr. Rivers Murphy, I'm going to uh, I'm going to indulge you and retell that story. 
uh, that I told in your webinar, because frankly, I had never intended to go beyond my classroom. You know, as, a, as an educator, I just saw kids who were in pain and had been traumatized, and, you know, whether, you know, for a multitude of reasons and who could really use this science that was benefiting me so much. So, you know what, I just started doing it in my class. So uh, one day I had had a really tough day with the kids. I mean, really tough day with the kids. Uh, they were pushing my buttons all day. If you're an educator, you know exactly what I'm saying. Just sometimes they're just on, they're on you and kids are smart. They know just what to do and just what to say to really get under your skin. So they were working me all morning. I barely made it to lunch. And normally during the lunch hour, I would leave my doors open so kids could come and use it as a home base. We had an open lunch. Uh, but that day I needed to rejuvenate. So I closed my doors, pulled out my yoga mat and started doing uh, some mindfulness. Uh, unfortunately, I'd forgotten to lock the door. And so a couple of my kids, and these were these are high school kids, and these were some of the roughest kids in, in, in the school. One of them you know, had forgotten something and he came back to grab it. And they walk in the door and their eyes get as big as saucers. And I can't use the exact terminology, but they said something down the line of, what are you doing? If you can imagine how they said it. Um, and I pretty much said, you know, it would take me too long to describe this. Just sit down and I'll show you. And these two young men sat down with me. I had extra mats anyway. They sat down with me and finished the work we did. 10 minutes later, they're looking at their fingers and wiggling their hands like they'd never seen their hands before. And then they're just like, wow, can we do this again tomorrow? And I said, yeah, yeah sure. So, you know, I thought that was the end of it. I kind of patted myself on the back. I felt better. I made it through the day. I didn't anticipate seeing them again, but sure enough, they came the next day. They closed the doors behind them. This was a Friday. They closed the doors behind them and came in and said, okay, we're ready, let's do this. So I was needless to say a little surprised, but we did it again. And we finished that. And remember, this is during lunch. They're giving up their lunch to do this. So. Uh, they say at the end of, of, of the lunch hour, can we do this again on Monday? And I'm like, sure, sure, sure. Uh, and again, once again, I didn't think I would see these young men again at lunch. It's very rare for a, a high school kid to give up that social time. It's the peak social hour of the, of the day. I, th I thought it was it. I was very proud. You know, I was patting myself on the shoulder all weekend. Hey, I'd, I had planted the seeds of, of, of maybe some good things that'll sprout later on. Well, sure enough, they came back Monday, but they brought two of their buddies. And those four people turned into six, six turned into eight, eight turned into 10, 10 turned into 20. And after about three weeks, we, we'd run out of, 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 of space in the classroom. We'd outgrown it. So uh, we were able to use the mini gym and we got up to about 60 kids roughly that were doing this weekly with me. And uh, at that point, I got the call from the principal, uh, Mr. Donald, will you come to the office, please? I'm like, oh, well, that, it was a good run. I enjoyed it while I could. Um, you know, I went in there thinking I was going to be asked to stop, but to my surprise, the principal said, okay, the, I don't know what you're doing, but whatever you're doing, let's do more of it because it's working. And I can see the difference in some of these kids in such a short time. How else can we use it in the school? So over the next four years, we created a school-wide program and we put, we tried everything just to see what would stick. Uh, and the, you know, if I had more time, I would describe some of our more, uh, um, uh, more interesting and creative ways that we brought mindfulness to the school. But bottom line is this got the systems the, the central office, the, the associate superintendents and the superintendent said, what's going on over there? Why are, your, uh, why are your teacher referral rates dropping by the year by large amounts? Why are your suspensions dropping like precipitously every year? Why are your graduation rates going up? Why are your attendance rates going up? And you know, I would like to say that it was all mindfulness, but it wasn't. It was it was good leadership, and there were many programs associated uh, along with that. However, uh, it it was unique, 
and we were able to, and the central office folks said, can you duplicate this at say 208 other schools? And I said, absolutely. So that was the beginning of system-wide leadership in, in mindfulness. And you know, the, the only thing I can say to you all uh, that you haven't heard from Jess and, and Dr. Rivers Murphy and Dr. Mason, and Dr. Owens and Khalil is that when your intention is there and your, your motivation and your energy is there, the doors will open. It, they will open for you. And when they do open, do not hesitate to walk through them, right? Be fearless, be bold, just go forward and do it and just watch the seeds grow. It's really amazing. It's uh, the blessing of my life to be able to have this position. I, I truly have the best educational job ever. I challenge anyone to tell me they have a better job than me. So I just want to say thank you again, everyone, uh, for listening to my storytelling. And uh, I, I hope that it gives you a little energy to go out and just do this yourself. Just go out and do it. There's nothing to be frightened of, just do it. Thank you. So Jeff, I always love listening to you. And I think I've heard that story now three or four times, but I, <laughs> I absolutely, absolutely enjoy it. And it's, it's always meaningful. And I just want to tell the group here that, you know, Jeff and Michelle are co-authors with me with a new book that'll be coming out next year on yoga, mindfulness, and meditation in schools. So um, last part of our sequence, who knows what comes after that, but, but it's an important part of our vision for what we can do for the future. And Paul is a co-author of the book on visioning for the future and doing a lot in Michigan and nationally with visioning as well as mindfulness. So Paul, your turn. Unmute. I've been on unmute for since 7.30 a.m. So um, I'm trying to spare you a little bit. So, so Jeff, I do have the, the best job in the world, I must say. Um, I'm 64 years old today. I've been in K-12 education in this work for 40 years. Uh, and my story is, is different in that I'm motivated because of people like you. Uh, Khalil, uh, Jess, uh, and Jeff, because you're doing the practical work, uh, boots on the ground, and making a difference. But my job is to scale what you are doing across the country. Um, I have four sons. One went to West Point. One is just getting out of jail uh, on the 22nd after seven months. He's manic depressive, uh, has 140 IQ, uh, and uh, Asperger's. Uh, my third son is an Air Force uh, fighter pilot and lieutenant colonel uh, and now directing the uh, U.S. Air Force Base in Tucson, just moving now from South Korea. Mm -hmm. And my, my fourth son uh, is uh, with four littles and manages about $3 billion of assets uh, on, in the market. And I tell you that because different personalities uh, and different challenges in life have led me to where I am today uh, as superintendent of schools for the last decade of my K-12 career, six suicides in a five-year period. Uh, and in my own child, uh, the one that's uh, bipolar, uh, spent 10 days uh, on a ventilator and the doctor said he wasn't going to survive. God only knows why he did, uh, but now I think we're seeing daylight with that child. All of those things impacted my motivation to scale this work about around compassionate schools, uh, my work with CEI, uh, and in other organizations across the United States and, and now uh, all over the world in Myanmar, South, South Korea, Japan, uh, and Mexico. But, but on the ground, we're working with Blue Cross Blue Shield, building healthy communities. We're working with 300 school districts, providing resources around teacher self-care. Uh, we've, we've to date spent $1.1 million in supporting Detroit public schools teachers uh, in, in self-care and additional resources. We partnered with the University of Michigan and uh, we're working at developing and scaling their trails program, which focuses on social emotional learning curriculum, a second tier focused on suicide prevention and a third on psychiatric and psychological care, intense care. Um, and, and then the TIPS program at U of M, which is a trauma-informed guidance document. 
And then our own association is focusing on strategic planning with a DEI lens, diversity, inclusion, equity lens. So everything that we're talking about in building in terms of a three to five year plan is focused on um, inclusion, diversity, and providing equity. At, and, and I'm not talking about awareness, right? Everybody wants to talk about awareness. Let's raise awareness. I'm tired of that, that conversation. Let's move to action, especially now. We have a chance like no other uh, in probably 50 to 75 years where we can change how people think and react and take action as we, as we deal with social issues, including mental health issues. And then we partner with Detroit Public Television uh, around curriculum mathematics, uh, and we're delivering, um, we're de delivering quality resources uh, throughout the state of Michigan via all of the satellite PBS stations. And we've built in a three minute SEL break, a mindfulness break between each of the instruction sessions. Uh, and the littles that are, are the, the five, six, seven year olds that are watching are singing the music and they're dashing to the TV, right? It's, we, we've created a uh, kind of a cult following with five year olds uh, and it's been, been remarkable. Uh, and so we've learned a lot over the course of time and, and I'm passionate about the work, uh, but delighted and, and most grateful to each one of you for you know, sort of carrying the water um, at your various levels uh, of influence and, and scaling this up. Uh, you know, bless you for the work. Uh, and if I can be of assistance uh, as I'm working anywhere in the country, I'll land on my, at my own expense, come to support you uh, in your work, uh, come deliver some tools uh, and meet with your school board members, your uh, central office administration, uh, and put them in a chokehold if necessary to get them to move. Chris? Wow. So I wish I could clone all of you. Wow. I mean, you think about everything Paul's doing. If we had 50 of these people, educators throughout the states, doing everything he's doing with the intensity we would get where we need to be faster you know so and and jess just thinking about what you're doing we multiply you we multiply jeff as part of our vision because we know we need that consistency we know that you know a yoga class here or there you know a mindful moment a mindful room in one grade but not in another in one district but not in another is not adequate there's far too much trauma violence abuse and now everything people have suffered from COVID in this last year, far too much happening for just, you know, a small little major. So what we say is we want a coherent approach, which we think heart-centered learning provides. We have a coalition now for the future of education. And um, many of the people you're seeing on, on the presentation today are part of the coordinating committee for that. You can go to our, my website at CEI and find out more about that. We've got a letter going to the Biden administration and the Secretary of Education saying, hey, if we're going to do this, let's do it right. Let's make sure that it's not just, a, you know, the drop in the bucket, but in fact, it is comprehensive, cohesive, and we increase the efficacy of what we're doing. And you can think back to this last year where, in fact, sometimes things went pretty well. And then other times, you know, people were floundering. We know that happened, it even happened for those who were most prepared. And in New England, with some of the work we're doing with mental health and Yale University, we worked with many people who've been prepared for trauma because that's what we were focused on. Like, what do we do to alleviate it? And even then, mm -hmm. it was hard. It's, it's really, when things get really tough, it's hard for us to keep going. But more of you doing more of it makes a huge difference. So I want to thank everyone. We have just a couple minutes left. Khalil, I'd like you to talk for a minute about diversity and equity and how we have to make sure we focus on that. And then if anyone has a question or two, we'll put it in the, the chat box and and we can hang around for five or 10 minutes if you like. I, you know, I know how your days go, so it's really up to you, but Khalil. You're on mute. That's always so funny. I can't wait to see the 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 movie that's going to come out about COVID and all of the blenders. But equity consciousness. Um, 
just a reminder of just sort of all of us as, as mindfulness educators and supporters, um, really looking at ways um, to really steep this this tool, this 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 this. Yeah, this tool, wherever we are. Um, I noticed that the work that I do um, in Washington, D.C., primarily in Ward 7 and 8, uh, where we've been trying to implement um, SEL and mindfulness, and there are just so many issues that are compounded, everything from Black Lives Matter, mental health issues, to homelessness. Um, you see a lot of fear around just a lot of fear in our in our in our um, in our communities, and you just see so many inequities. And I think a part of the awareness um, and and really uh, developing that empathy um, wherever you know we are witnessing inequities is, is just really really important. So using um, this tool of mindfulness, this heightened awareness, um, to really not only work with ourselves, but to share out and to make sure that we are leveling the playing field. Um, it definitely takes a village. So thank, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Wow. I would, just, I would just add just to um, conclude with just what we've heard is that what mindfulness does to address all of those different issues and levels that, that people are dealing with so much trauma and suffering right now is that mindfulness gives us that understanding, that acceptance, that ability to really show gratitude and that non-judgmental piece that can really help move the needle of change. Because those four things, think about it, understanding, acceptance, gratitude, and non-judgment fall under of the category that helps all those different kinds of suffering of racial you know, unrest right now and, and to the trauma and loss that people have experienced. So I wanna say that I'm always encouraged when I hear people like the panelists and what they can do. And the question is why we cannot do something but how we can get it done. And we're losing generations of kids every single year from not doing anything. And I agree with Paul, education and changing and moving towards a transformation in education to something that is heart-centered could not come too soon. So I thank you for the great work that you all do for those that weren't on the panel as well. And to keep the hope in faith because together and collectively we're that much stronger. So thank you all. So let's just take a couple of minutes. I'll go ahead and say, if you've got to rush to something else, please do, we do understand. But um, Jess and Jeff and everyone, let's just hang around for a couple of minutes and chat. And if people want to join in, fine. If they have questions, fine. But we'll take a couple of minutes. I want to so, share a point of uh, clarification. When I say I will uh, put your board president in a chokehold, that's a wrestling move, uh, and it doesn't it violates all of my SEL training. Um, so I would never uh, put him in an, uh, a chokehold, as my wrestling coach says. Don't say that out loud; people get the wrong impression. In any case, I will come and help convince them that SEL and compassionate uh, practices are are important more than ever. Uh, this week, I had had calls from districts where one, just recently near uh, my home hometown in Traverse City, three attempted suicides, two on the school property, attempted hangings, one in the bathroom in a high school, um, three attempted suicides. Uh, and the suicide rate, as you know, across this country has is, uh, grown dramatically with adolescents and teens. So we need to double down on our effort. And as it relates to even my own family, I, I look back uh, raising my own children, had I known then what I know now, uh, life would be different, right? It would be so much different for, for my own children, especially Ryan. And so, I don't know, wherever you're touching people, Jeff, you're touching kids uh, and influencing them in a bigger way now. You move from the classroom to you know, large scale connection. Wow, let's, let's scale that work. Uh, let's, let's figure out how to, as I heard someone say, let's clone you uh, so that we can get more of that but, but more rapidly, right? We need to scale this more rapidly than we are now. Let's not, let's not get 10 years from now and say, 
gosh, we just didn't move too fast enough. Let's move fast enough right now. So one of our next steps is really the scalability, how to make sure that we have sustainability so it keeps going and we scale this up. And so that this time is a beautiful opportunity to multiply these practices. Visioning is a beautiful tool to help with that. And um, I would just encourage you all to think about that and what you can do in your own mind, in your own vision. If we are all meditating and visioning on a future that has more mindfulness, I really believe that there's something with that collective synergy and energy to begin with. It puts us in our consciousness that means that probably we'll be more aware of what's going on with others. And we will use the practices. We'll talk about them. We'll share about them. And through that, you can think about all these networks. It's almost like the world, the universe is a gigantic brain with all these neurons and synapses running back and forth, right? And what we want to do is we want to open the neural pathways so that, in fact, there's the connection, the sharing, and we learn from each other. And that's what, kind of what we've done today. So my view is that is a lot of what the future is about. And it's really critical because this is a pivotal time. There's a huge influx of money right now for education for, to help us get out of COVID. Now let's try to do what we can so we get this money used in a way that will build these connections, build the sustainability, the scalability. Others? I just wanted to add again, you know, we have these amazing teachers with it, with whatever district that you're in that are doing this work, but they might be on their own little island, whether that's resistance from above having these programs put in place. Uh, you know, I'm in a district where there have been several opportunities right at our door, knocking on our door saying, let us help you. This is important. Let us in. And for whatever reason, you know, that wasn't able to happen and um, teachers have still been amazing with moving forward and you know to have our amazing paras and RBTs here they're the front line with us when we need help they're right there to help us in our schools with our students that really need that little extra support so even relying on your support systems within your school and encouraging them to use mindfulness practices that's a nice way to kind of branch out as well because they have those relationships with the students. So if we can encourage and share resources with them on how to spread the mindfulness practices and use them when they do have their social groups or things like that, that's a nice way to kind of help have those practices in place. And then also, you know, have teacher meetings where you have someone come in and model what does that look like? Because it should be part of our curriculum. You know, here I am saying on my high horse, this, this needs to happen, but I agree with Paul, this is important and things are happening around us and we have to listen. It is time to make a change and it is time to help these students, specifically our high school students too. They're, they're missing out on their, their junior, senior years. My daughter, I have a daughter who's a junior and she's resilient and strong and beautiful, but she misses her people. She misses being in school and it is affecting her in ways that I have to remember to be mindful and check in with her as well and just have her, you know, do herself positive affirmations as well. Um, not just with the littles that really, we have to keep a close eye on that, this, this cohort of students, you know, it is affecting all of us, but I think I dare you all be that teacher, be the weirdo teacher like me, who I turn the lights off. I say, take your shoes off. Let's take the minute. Academics can wait for a minute. Let's just find our rhythm. Let's take that moment and take that breath. And then the learning can happen. Create that environment that's safe for your students, that they feel confident and comfortable, that they can be vulnerable and have that mindful moment. And then you're going to see your academic success match as well. Join the weirdo team. We're, we're great. <laughs> we're fun. We like to do cool things. <laughs> you know what, Jess, your point's well taken because the proof is in the pudding. When what you and Jeff both described was this beautiful domino effect that it just takes you practicing and the curiosity of both little and small people, right? To, to be invited in. And it's so much easier to be invited into the practice than to explain the practice. And once you do that, not only with your students, whether it's only in your own classroom or you do it at a faculty meeting or you work with uh, school leaders, you can make, you can plant these small seeds along the way that have collective 
really collective benefit school wide. And that's how it happened. You know, everything's built, Rome wasn't built in a day. However, we can't lose sight. And, and Paul, I thank you for sharing and, and Jess and, and Jeff, because you're, you're talking about how vulnerable we all feel now. And that's not easy to do, but when you do it, it allows everyone, including your coworkers, your families, and most importantly, the students, right? To also know it's okay to be vulnerable. So I think that an open heart and leaning in to the suffering that's happening and reminding ourselves that we're suffering too, that when we all practice individually and collectively, and we plant those small seeds and don't stop or get discouraged that we can, it can really blossom into something great. And that's our work forward is to never stop believing that it can happen because the proof is on this panel. With that, any final word? If not, thank you for your attention. Um, I wish you a mindful evening, a mindful, peaceful sleep and just a beautiful week. Take care.